This is a production of Cornell University. I want to thank you. This is the first time I've um, been to Cornell in Ithaca, and it's quite lovely. I really like it, and I appreciate the, the fine weather that you've provided for me. Um, this is a series of uh, research projects that there's, there's a team of us that's been engaged with. Uh, this is kind of the, <coughs> the economic growth stuff is kind of what I'm taking the charge of. But there's a team of four of us, actually five of us. Uh, Laura Brown, who's with the Center for Community Economic Development with UW Extension, is really interested in very much kind of developing the extension education programming around local foods and community development. Anna Haynes, who is at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, and she's very interested in kind of the interface between natural resource sustainability, community development, and local foods. And Randy Fortenberry, who is now at Washington State University, um, he is really interested in kind of the farmer's perspective of it and, and how can farmers kind of take advantage of this, not more mainstream type farmers that can maybe perhaps fit into this. There's, a, there's a, another person, Amber Canto, who's just joined the team that is interested in looking at the relationship between local foods and public health. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we move on. Um, the question is, why are we so interested in the local foods movement right now from an economist perspective? This is the amount of uh, farms and, and total sales that are direct sales. This is the Census of Agriculture's data. And it's essentially kind of how much are farmers selling directly for human consumption. This would be uh, uh, CSA type sales. This would be farmers market type sales. This would be roadside stand type sales. And we can see that in 1982, there was actually a bit of a, a jump up in that. And the reason for that is that in the 1978 Farm Bill, there was a provision that allowed for a significant amount of grant money for farmers to go into farmers markets and try to sell directly. And whenever there's grant money, what do people do? They go after the grants. Well, you take the money, you got to do the work. Okay. So there was a spike in the amount of activity in kind of niche agriculture and local foods type agriculture. And then in the 1982 Farm Bill, that money went away. No more grant money. So what happened to the market? It collapsed. So as an economist, I'm thinking, well, was it purely the federal program that was promoting the local foods and, and alternative agriculture type of movement? This, as a, to an economist, would say that there's no market for it. Okay, there's no consumer demand for it. If there's consumer demand for it, then that market would have been sustained. But notice that over the past 10 years or so, that we've seen significant growth in direct sales for human consumption in the number of farms. And I think when the 2012 Census of Agriculture comes out, we're going to see that it maybe even has spiked up a little bit more. Now, this is being accomplished with really very little in terms of federal support. There's a lot of, you know, there's the Know Your Farmer initiative, but there really isn't the type of grant money that drove this spike right here. So from an economist's perspective, this is starting to say, well, wait a minute now. There's a market that's growing here for this type of agricultural commodity. This is a sustained market development, okay? Something has changed. Now, the question is, why is this growth in local foods? Um, part of it's a pushback on um, uh, large-scale commercial agriculture, part of it's a pushback on uh, foodborne illnesses coming out, not knowing where your food's coming from, there's health concerns. There's also a wealth effect here. As we become wealthier as a society, or at least the upper end, of the, not the lower end, the lower end's going lower and lower, but there's a kind of a, it's almost chic now to buy local foods. It's almost chic now to go to a restaurant that advertises that they're buying organic chicken from Bob the farmer down the street. It's become almost a status symbol to do that. Okay? Nevertheless, there is a market growth here. So, something's going on here that's worth looking at. Okay? Now, there's lots of reasons why the local food movement has been promoted. Justifications for why we should be doing this. Improve nutrition and health and diet related diseases. As a society, we do have a problem with obesity. We have a problem with diabetes. And uh, this is perhaps one way to kind of tackle that, become more sensitive to the type of food that we're consuming. Environmental sustainability. The argument here is that monoclonal, 
agricultural agriculture is not very sustainable. Okay? There's some arguments, there's some pushbacks on that, but that's one of the arguments. Transparency in food safety. Every time that there's another foodborne illness that pops out, what was the last one? Jalapenos that were coming out of New, uh, Mexico. Okay? Uh, got into fast food restaurants or something like that. Okay? In our local media in, in Wisconsin, you start to see a follow-up in terms of local food coverage. Okay? So it's a bit of a pushback on, on that. Food quality, there's an argument here that uh, you know, you're getting better quality food if you buy it at the farmer's market. Actually, there are some nutritionists that are saying that actually it's better to buy flash frozen. That if it's frozen, as soon as it's picked, it has better nutritional value than if it's picked, put on a truck, and shipped to a farmer's market where it sits for a day. Okay, so mm, it depends. That's one thing as an economist. Whenever I'm asked a yes or no question, I always respond, it depends. Okay, what assumption are you going to make? Social justice. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I, just, I just don't get that one. That comes out of the kind of the civic agricultural argument. Um, and it's, it's almost, if you start to read some of this, this civic agricultural, it's almost like coming to God. And that's, I just, I'm going to leave that one alone. Social capital, relationship building. The idea here is that we're building networks within the community and that we're building layers of social capital within the community. Okay, and we're gonna, I'll come back to that one. But the one that I'm interested in is rural and agricultural revitalization and community economic growth and development. Okay? In today's political environment, and I'm sure it's the same in New York as it is in Wisconsin, is that if you want any kind of state support or any kind of public policy support, you have to document how many jobs this is gonna create. Okay? That's the environment that we're in right now. Job growth, particularly with our governor. If it doesn't, if you can't demonstrate that this is going to generate jobs, he's not interested in talking about it. Okay? This is being argued left and right as a justification for the local foods movement. The problem is, is that there is zero research to back this up. Okay? Now, when we talk about growth, these two terms get used interchangeably. And they're really very, very different. Okay? Growth really is talking about more. More jobs, more people, more income, more businesses, more taxes. More, more, more. That's a growth concept. Okay? Development, on the other hand, is much squishier. We're talking about things like equality, sustainability, balance, economic opportunity, and quality of life. We're trying to make the community a better place to live. They're trying to make the community a place where people want to stay. We're trying to make the community a place where people want to move into. Okay? That's fundamentally different than simply growth, growth, growth. Now, there's a big argument within the community development literature whether or not do you need growth to talk about development. Well, how many economists do you have in the room? That's how many answers you're going to get. Okay? But they're very different, and oftentimes we use the two terms interchangeably. Okay? Now, this is one definition. Oh, there's, there's dozens of definitions out there. But this is one definition of economic development. Economic development can be divided as a, defined as a program, a group of programs or activities that seek to improve the economic well-being and quality of life for a community by retaining jobs that facilitate growth and provide a stable tax base. I personally would X that from there, chop it out. And I'd replace it with... See, now I wrote it down what I'd replace it with. Creating an environment that supports economic opportunities. Okay? That's much more difficult to quantify than it is simply saying we're creating jobs and we're creating quality jobs. Okay? What we're really trying to do is create an environment where if a farmer decides that they want to shift into a different product line, there are the opportunities for them to do that. If there are children that have gone off to college and decide they want to go back home because they want to go back home, that there are economic opportunities for them to do that. If there's a retiree, right, that has been out of, you know, say they retired 
uh, and you know they're going stir crazy at home. They decide they want to go back to work, part-time job doing something, that there are opportunities for them to do that. That's really what we're trying to move towards with development as opposed to growth. Okay? Now having said that, now having said that, I'm going to talk mostly about growth because that's what we can measure. Okay? It's very easy to count jobs. It's very easy to count population. It's very easy to count income. These other things are much more difficult to quantify. And I'll come back to that. Okay? But what are the rationales offered for community economic growth? Okay? Shorter supply chains resulting in higher profits. How many of you have heard that if you buy a, 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 quarter, of, a quart of milk and it costs you a dollar, only a nickel of that goes back to the farmer? Right? You've heard that, right? That's the supply chain. What we want to try to do is tighten that supply chain up so more of that dollar goes to the farmer. Okay? That's one argument, higher profits. We're kind of cutting back on the middleman. Okay? The problem, though, with this is that those supply chains serve a purpose. Those middlemen serve a purpose. Okay? Particularly when you're talking about the local foods movement, when you're talking about kind of institutions that want to get into that. There are a lot of hospitals in Wisconsin that are very interested in sourcing local foods. The problem, though, is connecting to those sources. Okay? If I'm a contract, if, I, if I'm the, the, the purchasing officer for a hospital, and I'm looking at buying you know, my, my produce and whatnot from Cisco, which are, is our big wholesaler, and I got one contract to, to write and monitor, or I got to deal with two dozen different farmers and two dozen different contracts, which one am I going to go with? Okay? That Cisco is part of that supply chain. They provide an aggregating service. Okay? That's a big hole in the local foods movement. We had a student that was completing her master's uh, work on the sustainability of the local foods movement over in the western part of Wisconsin. And there was a, um, um, a couple of hospitals in the region that wanted to, to buy local, but they couldn't, they couldn't work these contracts out. So what happens is there's a grassroots initiative to create what was called a, a fifth season, uh, the fifth season cooperative. The cooperative was supposed to be a marketing co-op. They would essentially bring these farmers together, and the co-op would market to the hospitals. Okay? Her kind of master's project was to do a, a business plan for this co-op. And she learned all the ins and outs of how to start a co-op and how to make it run like a business. And when she came back and she gave her kind of closing seminar to her colleagues, and these are all, remember, kind of the civic agriculture people, the kind of social justice type people, she actually said, you know, that middleman that we'd like to throw darts at, they serve a very important role. And we need to think about how we can develop more of a, an economic system. A lot of her class colleagues kind of, you know, were ready to throw tomatoes at her. But as an economist, you know, the three economists sit in the back of the room, we're all nodding our head, yeah, you know. Um, but there are initiatives or there are attempts to try to work on that problem. The ability to charge higher prices. This is the difference between a commodity and a product. A commodity is essentially something that a farmer sells into the market. Yellow corn number two. Okay, it's a commodity. Okay, or milk. Oh, I'm not even going to say milk because I can't get the classifications right. Um, but it's just going into the market, right? You can't tell if it's coming from one farmer or another. Those are commodities. Okay, those are whatever the market will bear. But if you can sell a product that this is organic valley cheese, right? People will pay a premium for that product. And a lot of farmers are trying to develop a brand, if you will, and they're able to charge a premium for that brand. And that's where a lot of the work is going. And with Fifth Season Cooperative, they're trying to turn that into a brand so that people are willing to pay a little bit more to take advantage and buy that brand. Okay? The argument then is that more of these profits are retained in the local economy. This is kind of the old Goldsmith hypothesis. Okay, is that rather than the profits going to absentee landowners, right, the profits are going to local farmers and it's staying within the local economy. 
Okay, that's kind of the argument. How many of you have looked at the fracking, the, the, the study that um, Tim Kelsey at Penn State did on fracking, right? What did he find? The, the argument was in Pennsylvania is that all these landowners are getting all this money and, and look at all this money that's coming to these rural communities. He found out that over half, I think 80% of the landowners actually lived in, Pencil, or lived in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. That money. Yeah, yeah, you do a map, you do a mapping. Uh, a colleague of mine at Iowa State always does the mapping of where the farm subsidy payments go to, and the Twin, City, the Twin Cities in Chicago is a huge spike. It's be, yeah, same thing. Okay, the argument, that's the Goldschmidt hypothesis. Okay, the argument is that more of this money is staying in the local economy. Okay, those are the rationales, those are the arguments. Okay, the problem that we have in moving forward and trying to understand this is what do we mean when we say local foods? Okay, what do we mean? The problem is, is that the definition of local foods varies across consumers, retailers, and intermediaries, okay? You ask a consumer what local is, you'll get one answer. You ask a retailer, a grocer, you're gonna get another answer, okay? It really varies. It also varies across product lines, okay? In Wisconsin, if you're buying Wisconsin apples in Chicago, that's a local food. Why? Because these are apples from Wisconsin. Okay? Now, is that local foods? It's really nebulous. It's really difficult to try to quantify what do we mean by local foods. Uh, Don Tillman at Colorado State University has been doing a lot of work on this, and it's, it's really a can of worms trying to come up with a definition of what we mean by local foods. Okay? So, what we know, okay? We know a lot about direct markets, things like farmers markets, CSAs, direct sales for human consumption. We know a lot about that. We have good data at the local level on these different types of measures, okay? We know very little about intermediate sales. These are sales that are going to restaurants, to hospitals, to schools, and increasingly jails and prisons. Okay. Now, Sarah Lowe and Vogel did a study in 2011 that essentially used the arms data to try to get an estimate of how much of these sales are going to restaurants and institutions as opposed to directly for human consumption. Okay. And what they found is that direct sales in 2007 was about $1.2 billion. Intermediate sales was about $4.8 billion. So when we look at local foods and we define it as direct for human consumption, farmers markets, CSAs, we're really talking about a very small part of the local foods movement. Now there's some current concern about whether or not that number is accurate or not. The way that the question is worded on the ARM survey is um, they could have worked on the wording of that particular question. Okay, so as more ARMS data comes available, hopefully we'll get, a, we'll get a better handle on that. Okay, I don't wanna give you that one. Let's skip that one, okay? Simple, simple model of economic growth, okay? This is, just bear with me for a minute here. What we wanna do is that we wanna look at growth. And the way that we're doing this is that we're essentially saying that there is a growth pattern in population a growth pattern in employment, and a growth pattern in income, and that those things are interdependent, okay? This original formulation kind of came out of the question, the old, old question, regional science, do people follow jobs or do jobs follow people, okay? That's what this was set up to try to address, okay? And we introduced income because people also move around because of income level. So what we want to do is that we essentially want to see how does local foods influence this type of a pattern. Now, I want to make one distinction here. Growth versus impact, okay? 
sometimes not only do we use growth and development interchangeably, but sometimes within this food literature, we use the term growth and impact interchangeably. And they're really two very, very different things, okay? Impact is very much of a static kind of concept. Bear with me. How, re how many of you remember your supply and demand from Econ 101? Ah, very good. Quantity, price. Demand is downward sloping. Supply is upward sloping. And there you have your nice, neat equilibrium and everything is good with the world, right? Everything is hunky-dory. Now, suppose that there's some shock to the economy. Suppose that consumers start buying more local foods, okay? There's a demand, shock. The demand for local foods goes up and we now have a new equilibrium. That change is impact. Okay, that's where the term economic multipliers come into play. You know, how many of you have heard that for every dollar in agriculture, there's an additional $10 generated in the local economy? How many of you believe that number? Good, I'm on a mission from God that that's not correct. Okay, that's impact. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, what we're talking about here is growth. What's happening is that this equilibrium right here is not static. It changes over time. It grows over time. Demand is constantly shifting out, or if we go into recession, it's shifting back. Supply is constantly shifting back and forth, right? Growth is what's happening in that equilibrium over time. That's what we're interested in. There you go. There'll be a quiz on this. Okay, that's as technical as I'll get, I promise. Okay, now how do we proceed? The first step that we have to do in order to get an idea on this relationship between local foods and economic growth is that we have to come up with a measure of local foods. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use direct sales for human consumption as our baseline. Okay, that's our truth. Again, we're missing that intermediate sales, all the sales going to uh, hotels, the sales going to restaurants, the sales going to hospitals. We're missing that. We know that. Okay? Well, what we want to try to find is the farm characteristics that are most closely tied to sales for human consumption. Okay? If we can find a set of characteristics of farms that are tied to that, then we can say that Communities that have more characteristics like that have a larger local foods type environment, okay? So what we want to do then is develop that proxy. Higher concentration of farms with these types of characteristics are associated with higher levels of local food. So what do we got? Okay. This is all 2002 census of agriculture because we want to look at how this affects growth into the future. We got number of farms with direct sales, okay? We got total sales. We got number of farms with sales between 100,000 and a quarter million. Number of farms including nurseries, greenhouses, selling vegetables, melons, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Number of farms selling sheep, goats, and their product. Number of farms including nurseries that sell fruits, tree nuts, and berries. And number of farms that are certified organic. We're thinking that the local foods farmer is characterized by these types of things. Now the one thing is notice that this sales category, oh, nope, nope, no, not on this one, sorry, never mind. Okay. So what we want to do is how much do these variables move together? And what this is is a simple correlation matrix, right? And you can see this is the p-value in the parentheses, so all of these correlations are statistically significant, and they're all positive, which is telling us that all of these variables tend to move together, okay? So if they're all kind of moving together, then we can kind of say, okay, now how do we take that movement and develop an index of local foods? And the way that we do that is we use principal component analysis, 
Okay? Principal component analysis is a technique that attempts to explain what that correlation matrix looks like. Okay? And using that relationship there, we can come up with what are called these eigenvectors. These are essentially the weights of these individual characteristics that explain the whole variance. Okay? So what are the three that really kind of come out? Number of farms with direct sales to human, that's our baseline. Total sales, direct value to human consumption. And the number of farms that are certified organic produced. Those are really the three that kind of go into our index. Okay? The other ones go into, but they're not nearly as strong. All right? Now, here's a mapping of our index. The darker the shade, the higher the concentration. Okay? All the white spots here, those are metropolitan areas. They're taken out of the analysis. Okay? And Alabama, they just don't report their data. I don't know. They just, maybe it's a government conspiracy. They don't want to belong to the census of agriculture. I don't I didn't say that. But there's nothing really surprising here. I mean, you look at, I mean, you look at other people that have mapped this stuff out, and you're seeing a similar type of pattern here. You're kind of seeing up in the Pacific Northwest, that's Portland, right? And Seattle, I mean, kind of the, then you got the Midwest, and then you got New England. And you got a few other spots that jump out. Now, the question is, is this pattern random? Or is there actually some kind of statistical significance to this particular pattern? that we're seeing. And what we're using then is a particular spatial test called the gitz ord test of association. What this does is essentially identify three things. Hot spots, cold spots, and statistically insignificant spots. Okay? So what do we got? We've got the dark ones are the hot spots. Right? And you can see where the local foods is actually kind of clustering around markets. The Pacific Northwest, the Northeast, kind of the Chicago to the Twin Cities belt, right? And then this area around Texas. That's Houston, Dallas, Seattle. That one kind of, you don't think of Texas as being kind of progressive with local, well, never mind. That's almost as bad as the uh, Alabama comment, okay? There are some cold spots. That's these gray areas. Well, that, that, that kind of makes sense in the Great Plains because so much of that land, well, one, there's no people living out there, all right? So there isn't a whole lot of demand. Second is that that land really is more conducive to monoculture type agriculture, okay? So that kind of makes sense. But notice the cold spot down here in the, in, in the southeast, okay? I've been playing with these indices for like, I, it's all blurring together in my head how many different combinations I've tried. The southeast is always low in local foods activity, always. Okay, but these kind of patterns generally type to pop up. Now, sure. Because we're looking at the production side. So we're looking at the actual location of the, f the farmers. Right. And we're looking at the, the impact of the farmers on the local economy, in not impact, on the growth potential of the local economy. Right. Okay? Like a lot of the that's true. I mean, that's, that's one of the problems of using county level data is that you've got these artificial boundaries. I mean, Penobscot County right there, right? That's, that's a metropolitan county because of Bangor. Bangor is down in the very southern part, okay? You go outside of Bangor, it's pretty damn rural, but it's still classified as a metropolitan area, okay? And that's one of the limitations of the data that we have. Okay. Oh, so there is right. a data for the area. Hmm? There is a data for the area, but for the area that we're talking about? For the, for the metropolitan area? No, they're there. Oh. They're there. I'm using MSAs.
Yes, correct. And that's, and that's the problem that we've got using county level data. You're right. Number of farms with direct sales. These are all adjusted. This is number of farms per thousand people population. This is total value of farms per population. And this is number of organic per 10,000 people. Okay, so the yeah, which is what we're using as our kind of our, that's our truth. So having those two pop out is really kind of reassuring. They should. They should and, and then these other ones just don't seem to, I mean, they still come in, but um, you know, the other one that comes in is vegetables, melons, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Uh, that, that's another one that kind of comes in. We use all of them. We use all of them. But it's dominated, it's, it's dominated by these three and, to some extent, that one. Yes, yes. Uh, in the seminar this afternoon, um, we play around with different ways of doing this, and they all basically come up with the same thing. Ah, coming to that. Coming to that. But that's actually, that's a very good point. Okay, now, because we're, we're modeling growth, right, we're using statistical techniques to look at how local foods influences economic growth, we're using regression analysis to do that. These patterns tell us that we may have a problem using traditional regression analysis. Particularly, it looks as though there's, there's spatial patterns in the data, okay? And if we don't account for those spatial patterns in the data, in the estimation, we'll end up with biased and inconsistent estimates and things blow up, okay? So we ran some tests to essentially see that's supposed to be a chi-squared. That's not a, I don't know what that is, but that's supposed to be a chi-squared. What this is are some simple spatial statistics on our three equations, population growth, employment growth, and income growth. Again, the p-values, all of these are significant, suggesting that there is spatial dependency in our data. So we have to correct for that in our estimation, okay? And if you're interested in the technical sides, come to the seminar this afternoon, okay? Here's our list of variables that we included as control variables. Population in 2000, employment, per capita income, that's what the theory tells us has to be there. And then we have this laundry list of other variables that we think are important in understanding rural, popula or rural uh, growth. Uh, percent of the age under 18, over 75, poverty rates, kind of where's employment located, population employment ratio, number of banks to kind of get an idea of credit, population density, ethnic mix, uh, da, 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 on down, okay? Uh, what we're looking at is growth from 2000 to 2007, okay? We cheated because we didn't want to deal with the Great Recession. So we just said, we're just going to look at 2000 to 2007, okay? So that's the time frame that we're looking at. I won't share with you all of the results, um, but what do we got here? These are the key. These are the key results. This is the bottom line, okay? We got population growth, okay? Positive, positive, statistically significant. So there's higher levels of local food measured by our index. We see faster rates of growth in population. Employment, not statistically significant. 
there's no relationship between the two. Per capita income, negative, statistically significant. Okay, so what do we got here? We got a mixed bag. The first one is there's a positive influence on population growth. Okay, is this an amenity effect? Okay, when you think of local foods type agriculture, what do you think of? Pretty red barn, black and white cows on a green pasture, right? Kind of pretty. Has a positive amenity effect. People want to live in that kind of an environment. In, the, the, in Greene County, which is just south of Madison, they decided that their economic development strategy was going to be tourism and agriculture. Okay? That's what they were going to, and they wanted the two of them to enter lace, right? Because they're thinking they can, get, they can get weekend travelers from Chicago to come up and enjoy the pretty countryside, right? Well, there was a large CAFO, large dairy operation that wanted to go in. Something like 4,000 cows with plans to go up to 7,000 cows, right? Well, that's their agriculture component. Greene County said, no, we don't want that because that's not our image of agriculture. That's not consistent with how we see agriculture and tourism interlinking. So they actually said no to this big CAFO, okay? There were other counties up north that said, come here. So they went there. But the idea, though, is that certain types of agriculture can have an amenity effect, and that can draw population growth, okay? There's no influence on employment growth. There just simply aren't enough jobs associated with the local foods movement to really have an impact on employment growth, okay? Actually, I got in trouble about a month ago because um, I kind of, to make a point, I said, you know, if you really want to promote employment growth in a rural county, you'll get more jobs if you open up a McDonald's. And when you stop and think about it, how many farms are we really talking about? A couple of dozen? How many jobs per farm? There simply aren't enough jobs being generated there to impact the larger economy. The last one. This one actually has policy ramifications. As we've been presenting this work around Wisconsin, we've actually had a number of advocates come up and say this is what they're seeing. What they're seeing is a large number of local food farmers that are essentially saying, I love what I do. I love the, the you know, I just, I love my job, right? but I got two kids to put through college. This farm isn't making enough money. So a lot of the education programming in Wisconsin is starting to shift towards the dirty word profitability. And this goes back to the story about fifth season cooperative, about it has to make business sense in order for it to survive. And that's where a lot of the attention is going now in Wisconsin is how do we make these pro farm profitable so that they can stay in business? Okay, so where are we at? Local foods and growth and development. Growth, okay, I should take the development out, I should put in growth. The, relation, the question that we had is what is the relationship? We found that there really isn't one, okay? The more that we play with it, that is actually the most stable set of results that, we can, that, that we've had, okay? Most of the results that we're getting is that there is no relationship. Okay, so what we're working at now is perhaps there's a relationship between local foods and public health, and that's where we're doing some work right now, is what is that relationship, and then does public health impact growth and development at the community level? That's where we're working right now, okay, and we're getting some fairly interesting results here that there is a strong positive relationship. The problem is the causation. What's driving what? Is access to healthy food causing better public health or healthier people demanding local foods? We can't separate those two out. Right now we're just trying to see if there's a relationship. The other one that we're interested in is the social capital component. The creation of a local foods movement, that networking, that know your, know your farmer, know your food type of relationship, that's building social capital, okay? What's the relationship there and what how does that go down to growth and development? That's where we're thinking right now. So we're kind of moving beyond this and thinking, 
in terms of that way. Okay, now the framework to put this in, I debated about whether or not to share this with you, but this is something that is maybe a framework to think about these relationships with local foods. Uh, Jan and Neil Flora have come up with a systems thinking approach to viable communities. They call what I call a, a vibrant community or community that's highly developed as a viable community, uh, two sides of the same coin. And they say that there are really seven pieces to the puzzle, seven different types of capital that are key in making viable communities, okay? Things like human capital, that's public health. Social capital, we just talked, political capital, financial capital, access to finance, built capital, that's things like transportation systems, um, uh, things like that, natural capital, and cultural capital. Okay? All of these things kind of come together to make for a vibrant community. So now what we're thinking is that can we use this kind of a framework to think about how local foods fits into the different pictures, okay? And the problem that we've got, perhaps, the systems thinking approach, does it take us back to storytelling and away from rigorous analysis? And that's where we're kind of, we're drawn in two different directions in terms of where to go with this work, okay? The way that we kind of left this with a lot of the, the folks in, in Wisconsin is that if you're going to be promoting local foods, you can't promote it as an economic growth strategy. There simply isn't the evidence to support that. It's more subtle than that. It might through, be through public health, it might be through social capital, it might be through one of these other capitals, but we don't have the research foundation to make that link. And you're not throwing anything at me. I'll stop, I'll stop there. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.